Hey, welcome back. This is Dr. Chad Kish, and we are in PEP 320, Assessment and Physical Education. And this is video lecture number two. This is actually the fourth segment, uh, including the uh, two in-class lectures for chapter two, Assessing the Psychomotor Domain to Enhance Student Learning. Uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, wrap up the chapter, uh, do some review material, uh, and explain your uh, culminating summative assessment uh, for this chapter's learning. All right, so this is module three, which is chapter two, assessing the psychodomator domain uh, of learning. All right, let's get started today. Today's big ideas. We'll start out with discussing how performance-based assessments have changed instruction uh, and improved it uh, over time. We'll talk about the progression of difficulty for a uh, variety of uh, our assessments, uh, how they should progress over time and start out focusing on one point of the form uh, and moving over time to form plus results. We'll talk about advantages of performance-based assessments over the uh, old school assessments. Uh, and we'll uh, summarize the chapter, tie it all together, and I will explain your summative assessment uh, development of a psychomotor assessment. Uh, this will be a shorter video lecture uh, today, so make sure you're actively learning, uh, taking notes, uh, and uh, preparing yourself uh, to wrap up the chapter and uh, ensure that you have learned all the critical aspects uh, from our student learning outcomes listed in the uh, module three uh, informational page. So, Let's start out by discussing how performance-based assessments have changed instruction. First of all, the main purpose of assessing uh, any type of student learning or participant learning uh, should really be to not only document student learning, but to improve student learning. Uh, so remember, we want to, the main purpose of assessment should be to really improve and document student learning uh, over time. Uh, we should focus in on the improvement uh, and then if we're actually assessing uh, we want to document that student learning uh, over time. So it's uh, it's critical uh, to consider performance-based assessment as leaning the teaching and improvement phase. Uh, teachers are encouraged also to coach students to reach a certain level of excellence. Uh, we need to remember that uh, when students are learning, they need to have the appropriate level of challenge. And that might be different for every student, so we might have to set the bar at different levels. But if students see something too challenging, uh, very few will continue to persist to try to reach that goal. If they see it as too easy, students might slough off or lack up in their performance or might not even be motivated thinking that's not a challenge. So we need to set that appropriate level of challenge uh, for student success. If we're a teacher, we'll also need to look at our grade level expectations to ensure that that appropriate level of challenge is pretty close to that grade level expectation. So remember, teachers are actually coaches who bring out optimal performance in their students. Uh, if we look at from the wellness profession area, when we wanna put performance-based assessments into an athletic setting, that's the coaches. You're trying to prepare the student for the game or the track meet or uh, the meet or whatever it is. So you're trying to bring out optimal performance in your athletes over time and continue to improve that through your culminating activity, which could be your uh, end of season tournament, uh, district, state, sectionals, uh, playoffs, whatever, whatever your state calls that. Uh, as a athletic trainer or wellness professional, uh, possibly a physical therapist, you're trying to bring out optimal performance in that participant to help them return to activity, whether that might be play or work activity or even just activities of daily life. Uh, think of it from a uh, personal trainer or a strength training and conditioning coach. You're going to try to get them to reach optimal performance when they get to that competition, whether that's weightlifting, uh, it might be a uh, a bodybuilding competition. Uh, it might just be a, a goal setting where somebody wants to reach a strength or a certain weight at a certain time. So when we're using performance-based assessments, 
you're going to focus in on the teaching and coaching of each other. Uh, and remember, this is teachers and students, or coaches and players, or professionals and participants are working together to enhance performance. And that performance might be student learning, or that performance might be uh, winning a game, or that performance could even be reaching a goal, depending on uh, what type of a realm you're in. So changing in the teaching philosophy and preparation is necessary. Uh, we're not going to just have a uh, certain fitness test uh, or skills test and teach towards that. We need to set our instructional goals to teach everybody the entire way uh, to do things. So we'll have an end goal. We'll do some backwards mapping uh, to, to figure out how we're going to get there. Uh, and then we're going to use performance-based instruction instead of just looking at results and seeing where they fall into a specific category. Because remember, our results, we might have to set a baseline of learning that's different for different students uh, based on their abilities and having an appropriate level of challenge. Uh, when we're doing this as a wellness professional, you need to figure out what the end goal for your participant is. Uh, as a coach, is it an individual performance? A lot of, a lot of uh, athletes look at their individual performance. I need numbers. I need stats. I need my uh, uh, um, personal best or my personal record. Uh, or is it team? I want my team to be successful. I want my team to win. Uh, is it a participant? I want to get back to work. I want to get back to play. I want to get back to activities. I want to get to where I don't have pain in my knee when I do things. So we need to change how we assess to ensure we get to our end goal and then plan backwards. And we've done that in our backward mapping activity earlier in uh, uh, the class. All right. So remember, as we assess, these assessments should be progressively more challenging or more difficult. Uh, in the idea of progressive assessment, think of the word progression. Uh, we're going to start where it's a little bit easier, where we're focusing on one part of a skill or activity, then we're going to add in multiple parts, and then we're going to also use the parts such as a, a full form of a skill, plus how it's applied in a setting, and what the results could be. So in progressive assessments, uh, students or participants evolve from the performance and assessment of simple to more complex skills, as well as how the skills are applied. Uh, as we move uh, through this progression, we need to try to move towards an authentic type of assessment, and we'll talk about those over time. But this is, authentic assessment could be in your gameplay, uh, in your real life or real world experiences. How do we really assess? All right. So uh, look at that. Uh, when we're in the wellness field, that is going to be authentic. Uh, are our tests going to actually help somebody get back uh, to doing what's on their job? So you, if somebody is uh, doing a lot of bending and reaching and lifting, if they're working in a, a warehouse type setting, we need to get them, if they've been injured, back to the, the skills of doing that. And then we need to come up with some kind of assessment that mimics what they do in work to ensure they can do that uh, several times and then make sure they don't have any pain or, or they're not doing it uh, with incorrect form to overcompensate for pain. So make sure our assessments, whether it's in the teaching, coaching, uh, or rehabilitation phase, are as authentic as possible. Uh, and they can be used to track either students or participants' performance over time. Uh, do you give them multiple opportunities uh, to be assessed and to see if they reach competence or an expert type category? Uh, let them work towards mastery. Once they've mastered a skill, give them a more complex skill or a more complex activity to keep that appropriate level of challenge. There are checkpoints along the way. So the teacher or coach needs to monitor student performance across trials and time. This gives you an opportunity in progressive assessments to start easier to start with a simple skill, to move towards more complex, to move towards more authentic, uh, maybe a faster paced environment, maybe have more variables, uh, and then give them multiple opportunities to succeed along the way. Uh, and this is where you can make the challenge more appropriate for your level of participant. What are some overall advantages of performance-based assessment? This is going to tie our first several modules together. Uh, this is a performance-based assessment allows you as the teacher 
to directly observe student learning or participant learning uh, in a program. Uh, this is where you're going to use your observational techniques uh, as a teacher, coach, or professional uh, to look at performance in a variety of activities, whether it's the beginning skill learning uh, or if it's uh, more of an authentic type assessment or uh, some group activities. So you'll have an opportunity to directly observe student learning. Some of the old assessment types, paper and pencil, true and false test, you're not going to be able to observe performance. Uh, and remember, in the health, wellness, physical education, athletic field, most of the stuff we do is active, involved, and we're going to have to observe a lot of movement patterns. And you can't always uh, replicate or gauge understanding with just a uh, paper and pencil type test. Uh, it provides us an opportunity to have good instructional alignment. This might be instructing in a PE course. Uh, it might be the alignment of more of a progression of activities. Do we teach the skill first, one part of it? Do we teach multiple skills? Think when we're an athletic trainer, uh, we're going to do different tests to try to uh, figure out where we're at um, uh, with, with a possible injury. Uh, if we're helping somebody to return to play, we're going to start with doing the uh, activities for some flexibility and strength, and then we're going to move up uh, and have a sequence where you might uh, do some things on the move, you might do some things at half speed. So it's gonna provide us an opportunity to systematically develop a good sequence of activities. Uh, and when we have a good sequence of activities, we can go back and tie that to the assessment. Are we actually assessing what our end goal is? And are we having checkpoints along the way that assess ways to get to that end goal? That's backward mapping and that's instructional alignment. When our assessment actually test what our end goal is or what we're looking for that is alignment and make sure our instruction and our activities lead towards that end goal. Uh, Performance-based assessments allow us to test or assess uh, students in interesting type assessments. Uh, when I was a, a player or coach doing the same drill over and over for you know you're just doing the drill to do the drill uh, how do we actually score that? How do we compete with that? How can we make it interesting in an athletic setting? Uh, do we just want to do defensive drills or do we want to explain to our team if we get, uh, in basketball we use the scenario, if you can get five straight defensive stops without fouling or scoring um, two times each half, the opportunity to win a college basketball game is at about 90% the way we played. So we would do drills where we made it interesting, where our defense would have to get five stops in a row without fouling or letting the opponent score uh, and corralling the rebound to end the offensive segment uh, to be able to end their, their practice on that drill. So if the offense kept scoring, uh, they would have to continue to do the drill. So it made it interesting. Our, our defense really would start to get after it. All right. As well as if you're going to have some interesting assessments in a class, can you add in some psychomotor activities such as an event task? Uh, can you do some kind of cooperative uh, uh, learning? Uh, can you work, uh, we'll look in the next chapter, in things such as role play, All right? It provides uh, performance-based assessing, uh, provides an opportunity for instructional feedback. If you look at our three observational techniques, the teacher-coach observation, the peer observation, and then the self-observation, it allows an opportunity to provide feedback to our participants. And as long as that feedback is focused, we can start working on improvement, All right? We can measure multiple objectives and concepts along the way. This would be if we have some kind of activity, say we're in gameplay or a modified gameplay, we can look for one specific skill, such as the serve and volleyball, but we can also look for communication. We can look for multiple complex skills tactics, All right? We, uh, we may, uh, those would be three different NASPY standards. NASPY standard one would be on the movement pattern of the start. NASPY standard number two would be on the tactic strategies uh, to be able to move uh, one team to one side and then drop the ball on the other side away from the defense, which is a tactic or strategy of a net game. And it might be the ability to co communicate and cooperate with teammates uh, to be successful in the activity. That would be NASPY standard number four. Uh, so there could be three multiple objectives and standards in gameplay and modified gameplay type of activities. It provides opportunities for active student learning. They can not only learn the form, uh, they can 
if, if we progress our teaching and our activities and our assessments uh, from easy to more complex or more difficult and more challenging, we allow an opportunity for active student learning over time. If you give them multiple opportunities to be successful uh, with, a, with a, an activity, whether it's just in a one-on-one -on -one setting, uh, if you're assessing them through a skills test or assessing them through gameplay, that's going to be different opportunities to provide active student learning. We also provide higher order thinking skills. If you go back to our DOK levels, uh, you can allow students to do more than one thing. Are we just focused on completing a skill or are we completing the skill in a more authentic or real world scenario? This provides opportunities for higher level thinking skills and teaches students how to do things such as problem solve, analyze, evaluate, cooperate, uh, uh, develop things, construct things. Uh, when we use multiple performance-based assessments, students have a variety of chances to get them right. So remember, we should work towards mastery. So even if a student doesn't get the skill right the first time we do it, when we practice it over time and sequence it out, uh, the student will have multiple chances to get the skill right and to learn. Uh, and that's really what it takes in learning. You have various opportunities. You don't just go out and shoot one free throw and say, I'm a good free throw shooter or not. You're going to practice it. You're going to do it over time. You're going to have multiple chances to uh, show your ability. And performance-based assessments, uh, when built or developed uh, um, with a uh, open mind and thinking outside the box and being creative, can be more enjoyable for students. I don't know anybody that really enjoys going to take an exam, a paper and pencil test, a multiple choice test. Uh, they, they might have a slight bit of enjoyment if they do well. Uh, but when you prepare and uh, use performance-based assessments such as gameplay or modified gameplay, or even an event task or some of these other things, students can have fun and it's more enjoyable way of learning. I only remember NASPE standard number five is we need to figure out a way for students to enjoy these activities, whether it's for their own challenge, uh, whether it's because they like creative movement, or whether it's because they enjoy uh, working their way in, into fitness, or if they just like it for social interaction. So let's get a chapter summary here. All right, performance-based assessments provide teachers opportunities to assess student learning in a real world or authentic setting. Uh, if we think of a PE teacher, we can progress to more authentic type settings. Not just doing a rules test, can we allow students to officiate a game, right? Not just do you understand tactics or strategies, can we have them watch the video of an offense and design a defense to stop that, all right? That brings our students to higher levels of DOK, uh, and allows them to create, analyze, synthesize material. Uh, it's more challenging uh, and it prepares them for life outside of the school classroom. So these performance-based assessments can also be put into the health and wellness field. How are we going to use them to help people meet their end goal, whether that's to be more healthy, to be stronger, to return to play, to return to activity, uh, to, uh, to be better and more healthy. So if we can build some performance-based assessments that focus on end goals, that's why we did the backward mapping activity, uh, and we're going to do this end uh, activity here uh, to, to summarize uh, our learning in this uh, chapter two. So performance-based assessment, PBA, allows teachers to assess the application of skills and knowledge. It also allows coaches to do the same thing. When we do modified gameplay, we're going to assess the performance of our athletes and then coach up their application of their skills, try to give them more knowledge. If you think of it in an end-of-game situation, if you haven't practiced that over and over in football, the two-minute drill, in basketball, the last-second shot, in soccer, the, uh, the penalty shot, uh, in uh, uh, overtime-type situations, special situations, you're not going to be able to perform those. Uh, you should perform those in a practice setting pretty regularly uh, so, so your participants have competent, confidence when they go into those situations. But PBA also allows teachers to really assess the application of skills and knowledge in more of an authentic setting. Performance-based assessment is critical in physica physical education and health-related or wellness-related fields due to the regular use of observations of performance 
as an assessment technique. Remember, in our field, most of the things is active based. There's going to be movement related. It's not a lot of paper and pencil type of things. So we need to learn how to observe and how to turn that observation into a record to uh, observe that performance, not only to provide feedback, to, but possibly to document that level of performance. As a physical therapist, we're going to need to document that people are ready to go back to work and they can end their prescription uh, for PT. Next, the use of regular performance-based assessment in the tactic of formative assessment. Remember, formative is during the instruction, during the activity, your coaching. It provides the spot for instructional, on-the-spot feedback. This shouldn't be the feedback that's good job, a boy, a girl. Uh, you know, keep going, you'll get better. It should be the on-the-spot instructional feedback, such as make sure you extend your arm on the throw, uh, get to the stance first, stay on balance, follow through. It should be more of instructional feedback to improve performance. This is what's called to me coaching and teaching, all right? And finally, performance-based assessment allows us to use higher order thinking skills. It's different than just memorization, uh, regurgitating information, uh, the ability to, to just know things. Performance-based assessment allows us to actively do things. And if we can tie those to real world setting or authentic type of activities, we're going to give the opportunities for our students or participants to use higher order thinking skills uh, and improve both mentally and physically. So just to follow up, a uh, closing note on the uh, Module 3, Chapter 2, uh, Information on Psychomotor Assessments. Uh, we must not lower our academic standards to raise the perceived performance levels of our students. So yes, it's critical for us to find a baseline for our students, to provide the appropriate level of challenge, to modify and adapt activities to our performers' uh, strengths and uh, and give them opportunities to overcome their weaknesses. But we need to look at the accepted level of performance and try to do everything we can to design instruction and assessment to get them to that performance level. As a teacher, that would be the grade level expectations for the activity you're doing. As a college professor, those would be the professional standards uh, for teaching that might be the MES standards. All right, for health education, that might be the health education standards. It might be your professional standards as an athletic trainer. All right, so it might be the level of performance needed if you're a coach to be successful playing against the competition you're going to play at the level that's expected. Is your program uh, built to develop skills, provide opportunities for challenge? Or is your program expectations to win games? So what are your standard level of performance? So even though, like I said, we want to have an adequate level of challenge, we need to find that expected level of performance and not water it down, try to make that adequate challenge progressively get more difficult over time to get to the academic standards or the expected performance levels. Next. A classroom environment focusing on the development and learning must hold students accountable for these high academic standards. So first of all, we need to be clear and we need to be non-negotiable at times. So when we backward design a lesson or a program for performance, we need to have a clear ending target. Is that the grade level expectations? Or is that the expectation that somebody completing their physical therapy sessions can return to work? So what are our clear performance goals? And then we backward map from where we want to go to what our baseline is, and we find checkpoints along the way to make sure we can get there. Our standards need to be adaptable at times, but our end goal still is normally going to be non-negotiable. So we need to try to hold students accountable or hold our participants accountable to get there. We may have to take our short-term goals and reassess those, but our end goal is probably going to stay the same. And last, classroom assessments 
should define for our students what we expect of them and should be focused on important achievement targets. This is a Stiggins quote uh, out of the textbook. It was from 1997. I'll read the quote one more time. Classroom assessment should define for our students what we expect of them and should be focused on important achievement targets. So if we can look at our end goal, tell our students what we expect of them at the end goal, and then backward map to where they are now, we can then focus on our important achievement targets over time uh, and hold students accountable to high academic or performance standards uh, over time. Like I said, we might have to adapt these, we might have to modify them, we might have to reassess, we might have to have an appropriate level of challenge for the day, but our appropriate level of challenge for the end game should be our end goal, and we shouldn't really negotiate that one. We should keep that high, because if, if we increase our challenge over time, the cream tends to rise to the top. Uh, people tend to reach for high performance levels uh, once they learn the skills and try to achieve those. So let's talk about our assignment. We did a uh, journal activity on this, uh, but now we're going to turn it into an assignment with a little bit more depth. Hopefully uh, from last lecture you kind of have an understanding through our, our journal activity and discussion. But our culminating or summative uh, assessment which is considered a progressive assessment because we had a checkpoint along the way with our, our journal and discussion, is going to be the development of a psychomotor assessment. So I'll give you a summary. In this assignment, you, the student, will develop a psychomotor assessment. You can develop any one you want, but it's going to need to be detailed, and you're going to have to put some thought and creativity in this. This isn't a copy and paste something from the internet. This is a be creative, build it from your own, summarize the information you've been given over the chapter, analyze some uh, some different uh, ways to go about it, possibly do some research, and then you're going to create or develop an activity. All right, so that is a higher level order of thinking that you're going to do in this assignment. So you're going to choose any of the psychomotor assessments we discussed in this chapter, in chapter two. So that could be anywhere from an event task to gameplay to modified gameplay to observations. So you're going to look at that grid of, uh, of different psychomotor assessments and you're going to choose one, your choice. You can make it where you are a physical education teacher, you are a college level teacher teaching your uh, prefer preferred career field if you're teaching an athletic training class while you're a grad assistant or a physical therapy class. Or you can consider it a wellness professional uh, when you're doing some kind of training or you are the lead teacher coach uh, in an activity. Uh, so you're going to figure out how you're going to implement this assessment that you choose into your PE classroom or your professional wellness uh, career field. So here's the four things you'll do. And then I'll pull up the assignment to give you a little bit more information of what I expect for each of these four. First of all, you're going to list the psychomotor assessment. That's pretty clear. Next, you're going to fully describe the assessment, what you're going to do. Then you'll describe how you will design and apply the assessment, what kind of sequence. This is where you dig into some more detail. And then finally, you'll describe how you're going to collect data to provide a record for the assessment. You might have to do a little research here. I know we haven't had our chapter yet uh, on developing rubrics and scoring guides, but you'll have to do a little research to explain how, how you're going to do this. And you're going to submit this as the culminating activity uh, for Module 3, Chapter 2, See the Deadline and the Assignment on Canvas. Here is what the assignment looks like on Canvas. Development of a psychomotor activity. I would say you should probably do this in a Word document and then come back and attach that Word document or submit it uh, as the activity. So, a little more information. Number one is pretty simple. You're going to list the psychomotor assessment type. Number two, you're going to describe the assessment. What do I expect? In a paragraph, describe and explain what the assessment is, how it possibly can be recorded, and any additional information on the assessment to explain how it was detailed in the textbook and discussed in class. So you're going to summarize what a 
For example, a teacher observation of an activity would be, but you're going to explain I'm doing a teacher observation of modified gameplay uh, in volleyball, and I'm going to assess uh, this by recording the ability of, for students to do different skills as well as work within a team setting. There's an example for you. Number three, you're going to describe how you will design and apply the assessment. So in a college level paragraph again, describe and explain how you will use this assessment in the field. Explain your design, how you're going to implement it, how you're going to apply the assessment in the field. PE teachers consider that classroom assessment. Wellness students consider this as an assessment in the field or consider it as an assessment if you're teaching a graduate class based on your career path. So construct a project based on this psychomotor category. You're going to describe the psychomotor assessment here, and then you're going to explain your specific one here and how you're going to go about it. And number four, in a couple of sentences, although you've explained it a little bit here, I want you to provide more detail and explain how you're going to collect data, keep score, or evaluate overall performance. What are you actually going to assess? If it's our volleyball unit, are we going to assess the serve? Are we going to uh, assess the form of the serve or the results of the serve or both? And then how are you going to record it? So here you're going to have to maybe research a little bit about assessment types and recording data. You might look ahead in your book and skim uh, the chapter on developing rubrics. Uh, and you're going to analyze and summarize this uh, information to be able to describe how you collect data in a couple of sentences. So this assignment, uh, make sure you complete that. It is a culminating activity for uh, Module 3, Chapter 2. So we'll close today with uh, going over your to-do list. Make sure now you've been all the way through Chapter 2 and you've got all the material. You're going to take a Chapter 2 review quiz uh, over this chapter, uh, Module 3, Chapter 2, Assessing the Cognitive and Effective Domain. All right. Uh, what you're going to do in this chapter, I'm sorry, this is uh, assessing the psychomotor domain. Uh, you are going to uh, take a 10-question quiz. You'll have 20 minutes. Uh, it's just like the previous quizzes here. There'll be a variety of safeguards. You'll get one question at a time. It'll be multiple choice and true and false. So make sure you take that by the deadline. The Chapter 2 review quiz covers stuff from the textbook as well as the lecture series uh, on Chapter 2. Next, you're going to have your cumulative, summative, culminating assessment or assignment of developing a psychomotor assessment. In this one, you're going to pull all the information together from Chapter 2. Uh, you're going to use the background probably from a previous journal assignment, and you're going to provide a very detailed analysis on the development of a psychomotor assessment. And then finally, before we meet in class next time, after you've finished one and two, you need to read chapter three. You never know when we might have a reading quiz. Uh, so it's a lot easier to have our course discussions uh, and to do some active learning and have some give and take uh, in the classroom lectures if you read the chapter and have some background for the material. Remember, as an instructor, it's not my job to teach you the textbook. The textbook provides you the background so then I can go deeper uh, into understanding and applying the knowledge. So make sure you're doing me a favor, uh, obtain that textbook, read chapter three, and chapter three is assessing the cognitive and effective domain. And we'll go over a variety of other assessments uh, throughout the chapter. All right, if you have any questions, uh, email me. If we need to set up a video conference, we can do that. Be very specific in your email so I understand what you're looking for. Uh, hopefully uh, you've enjoyed our learning here in module three of chapter two. We've expanded your thinking. We've given you an idea what uh, assessment would be, uh, especially performance-based assessment based on the psychomotor domain and how you can apply that in both the physical education classroom and the wellness field. Have a great day. Uh, we'll see you next time.